live from U.S. Cellular Field. Yes, the Windy City, the Rainy City. Game one featured the heat of Bobby Jenks. Game two, a whole lot of wet stuff. 45 degrees. Look at the humidity. I think it's a little bit more than 81%. I'm feeling about 100%. Uh, just about. Chris Myers, can you give us the status of the game in the field? Yes, uh, well, we're going to play ball. I walked the field uh, moments ago. They just pulled the tarp off. The fans here in Chicago were cheering, so the game is scheduled to go on time despite the rain falling. Jimmy Lee Solomon with us, the executive vice president of baseball operations, just came out of the meeting moments ago with the groundskeeper, the commissioner of baseball, the general manager from both teams as well. And uh, how did you arrive at this decision? It'll be like rain uh, intermittently most of the evening. We saw that there'll be an open band coming through that will give us about 30 minutes of light uh, rain, and then we'll have a heavier one that'll come through in about maybe 30 to 35 minutes. Then we will have a, a, another opening about 15 or 20 minutes, and it'll be like the rest of the night. All right, so we'll play in the rain. Now, uh, the baseball uh, officials decide this. Once the game starts, is it in the hands of the umpires yes, if the is. game is called? Umpires, you're right. Yes, it is. All right, and if there was a postponement or a continuation, would that be tomorrow night? Likely tomorrow. I don't know, or, uh, afternoon or night, but probably tomorrow night. Okay, but right now we're starting on time. We're going to get it in tonight. Okay, thanks, Jimmy. All right, good job. And we'll thank the weather guy and the groundskeeper telling me that they have the ability here on this field to handle two inches of rain. It'll drain within 20 minutes. Jeannie? I think we have the ability to handle about one inch of rain. Feeling pretty soggy. <laughs> Kevin Kennedy with Jeannie's Alaska who welcomed me to Game 2 of the World Series. It turns out the only thing scarier than this weather or facing the White Sox rotation is facing the relievers. Now that you have seen the White Sox bullpen. Have you had enough? Hey, yes. I, I think the Astros had enough of that 99 to 100 mile on fastball of Bobby Jenks last night. Exactly right, Jeannie. They brought him in for a four out save. Ozzy Guillen did in the eighth inning because their situation dictated that. And Ozzy. Oh, he didn't just bring right him in. Move. It yeah. was theatrics. He wanted to make sure it wasn't. Why the big Polite. theatrics? Well, if you bring in Polite, you bring him in only in a tie game or when they're down. When your closer has a chance to save the game for a four out save, you bring him in. But before he got to that this point, is... Neil Koss got two big strikeouts right here. And There's then, the, big and then the big guy. The big guy. How about that fast? to finish it off Jeff Bagwell 101 miles an hour he hit last night then in the ninth inning was pretty much lights out a little breaking ball for good measure then back to that fastball 99 to 100 miles an hour and Adam Everett finished it off not just a 99 to 100 mile fastball how about the cut movement to go with it you saw it against Bagwell you saw it last night against Everett to end the ball game right there Bobby Jenks has only 108 days in the big leagues first rookie to have a save in the major leagues in the World Series since 1995. Another good move by Kenny Williams getting him on waivers from the Angels. Absolutely. All right. Game one will also be remembered as the shortest World Series outing of Roger Clemens career. Turns out he had a pretty good reason to leave. He used a couple of words you do not want to hear. You don't want to hear the word tear. No, you and don't you want... don't want to hear the word fluid. Well, Jeannie, the left hamstring was pulled in September. I'm really surprised he's been pitching as well as he has in the postseason. It was apparent earlier in the ball game. He didn't have command. Rogers always able to repeat his delivery. He wasn't able to do that last night. Got the ball up, and the White Sox took advantage of it. Obviously, that's going to affect the way this series goes. But we should point out no official word yet as to whether or not he right. will miss a start or be there. Question mark surrounding the Rocket. But catcher Brad Osmus says tonight's starter is the answer to a lot of what ails the Astros. <laughs> We had one game that we had to win. Andy Pettit would be the guy that I would want on the mound. Uh, he's got a ton of postseason experience. He's done well in the postseason, uh, and he's pitched on the grandest stage in baseball in the postseason, which is uh, Yankee Stadium. So uh, for me, Andy Pettit's the guy. The Dartmouth grad knows of what he speaks. Yes, he does. Well, in seven game two starts following a loss in the postseason, Andy Pettit has gotten the job done. Obviously, as a New York Yankee, we've seen it so many times. He's 4-2 and two with a 2.17 earned run average following those losses after game one and he's averaged seven innings and that's really what you're looking for postseason career game twos 3.30 earned run average you would probably take that i don't think it's going to be a high scoring game because of the weather tonight one good thing for andy pettit he's been through this before in a postseason not just game two is coming up big but pitching in cold weather a lot like new york and when i talked to him the other day he was so fired up to get this start because obviously the injury the surgery he missed all of the postseason last year wants to make a difference and no doubt Pettit has spent countless hours viewing the scouting reports. Several months ago, the word on Joe Creedy would have probably said gold glove defense, no bat, no more. He has turned the postseason into his personal coming out party. He is the star of our sharp Aquas more to see moment. A home run hit by Creedy into left center field. What a postseason, Tim. Joe Creedy is having. He is making a name for himself. 
Joe Creedy came up big last night. Solo home run in the fourth thing turned out to be the game winner. You can look at his postseason numbers, 281 batting average with nine RBIs, and there's always more to see with Joe Creedy because not just the offense, Jeannie, the defense last night in the sixth and seventh inning to save games at third base, save runs at third base where they might have tied it. The Astros might have tied it or gone ahead. Joe Creedy came up. He was the all-star of yesterday's game. All right, still ahead weather, yes. Delay, no. That We're hearing that they're ready to play ball. The game will start on time, but don't blink. Mark Burley is apparently on a stopwatch. We'll explain when we come back. Chevy MLB pregame show on Fox. Chevy and American Revolution live from U.S. Cellular Field. Despite the weather, although it is, it is clearing up, of course, the tarp off the field, getting ready to go here. But it's 45 degrees, Dini. Hitters do not like to hit in the cold, I'll tell you that. Once the pitchers get warmed up and get through that first inning, they get into the flow of things. Hitters, they go inside them, jam a few guys, their hands. They break like ice. <laughs> Talk about maybe potential delays and what that would do to the pitching staffs here. I mean, obviously, the Roger Clemens blow last night really worked the bullpen over for Houston. The last thing they want is a delay where Pettit may have to come out of this game and they really have to work the pen again. Well, and they already used Wandy Rodriguez in relief yesterday in the second and third inning, and the Astros don't want to have to go to the bullpen early once again. But I think that's why they're going to start this game. The commissioner is involved in this decision. They know that neither club wants a delay for an hour. If you have a delay for 45 minutes to an hour, Normally, you take your starting pitcher out. I don't think that's going to happen tonight. What it also affect tonight because of the rain and the wet grounds a little bit, even though the infield's been covered, it could affect the running game of both these ball clubs a little bit. Yeah, someone needs to go tell Craig Biggio they might not play tonight. I don't think that would settle too well. <laughs> these guys look like they're ready to go, and the fans here, they've waited 88 years for a championship, and apparently Mark Burley doesn't want them to wait any longer. He is doing his part. He'd go faster if only his catcher could catch up. There's actually a lot of times that I'm waiting for him. Um, I don't know if he's thinking or just, just kind of giving the hitter an extra second or what, but there's a lot of times I'm, I'm on the mound staring, waiting for the sign, and he, you know, he kind of gets down and plays with his glove, and then he puts the sign down. So uh, I've gotten on him a couple times joking around about saying, hey, I'm waiting for you. Hurry up, give me a sign so we can get going. I have to slow him down and let him catch his breath sometimes. He works so fast and so quick, and there's times where he gets a little out of control and, and Burley has to slow, be slowed down and I have to kind of pull back the reins and say, hey, let's slow down for a second. And He doesn't like it a whole lot, but he understands that there is times where you know, he might give up a hit, he might have to go cover first, and he needs that little breather instead of just saying, okay, I'm on the mound, I'm ready. Mark Burley likes to work fast. His average starts in the postseason, two hours and 32 minutes. That is good news for the defense, especially on the cold night. It keeps them sharp. The postseason so far, three hours and one minute is the average game. So you can see how fast Burley likes to work. Andy Pettit getting ready for his postseason start. He's had three so far this postseason. ERA 4.66. So you can see with 12 strikeouts. But like I said before, Jeannie, he's been through it before in cold weather. He's pitched in October. In fact, uh, the Yankees have been played November one year. We know that a few years ago. So Andy knows how to pitch in this cold weather. For the Chicago White Sox and Mark Burley, it might be a little different. But Burley has the best ERA as far as home field advantage in Major League Baseball at 2.48 when he pitches right here in Chicago. Yeah, we talk about the home sweet home. Of Pettit, of course, pitched in the World Series, but never in this Astros uniform. True. How big would this win be for him tonight to head home to Houston all tied up? Well, I think it's a must-win situation for the Astros because if they lose tonight, I think Chicago has a real chance to win it in five back in Houston. So, to me, it's a must-win. And I know you love these stats. 11 of the last 12 clubs to go up two games to none in the series have taken the series. This has been the Chevy MLB pregame show. Joe Buck and Tim McCarver will be back with tonight's first pitch of Game 2 of the World Series. Welcome back to the Chevy Major League Baseball pregame show on Fox. Chevy and American Revolution. 
We're coming to you live from U.S. Cellular Field, and right now we go to public address announcer Gene Honda. It's our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight over the ramparts we watched, they were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in the air, they The great Lou Rawls with his rendition of the Star Spangled Banner doing a great job singing in the rain. It is drizzling here in Chicago, but off we go. World Series game number two. Astros and White Sox coming up. And we welcome you back to the Chevrolet Major League Baseball pregame show on Fox Chevy and American Revolution. U.S. Cellular Field, the White Sox up one game to nothing, and we are ready to go for game number two. And you look at Joe West. He's the crew chief for this umpiring crew. It has been raining, really, since everybody got to the ballpark early this afternoon. It has been heavier at times. It picked up moments ago, and as we were getting ready to come on camera, on came the tarp. However, they haven't pulled the tarp over the infield, and now they look like they're rolling the tarp up, and we are ready to go, I think. <laughs> How about that? Hi, I'm Joe. Tim is here, and uh, I mean, we are really in no man's land. Uh, right now, we saw the tarp come out. Joe West came out uh, from the umpire's dressing room and said, not nah, leave the tarp off, but the pitchers right now are not ready to go at this very moment. Well, the one problem uh, that the game has and baseball has is that by waiting out there uh, without the tarp on the field, then that gives the infield a chance to get wet. And uh, you don't want that situation to, to happen. You know how badly? I just want to turn around and, yeah, no, they haven't pulled the tarp on the field yet. So I guess we're going to go. But as I said, the key for these uh, for these starting pitchers, and we're going to talk about them in a second, is that they started to warm up. They did their long toss. They started to loosen up. And then the rain started pounding down. That's when they dragged the tarp on the field. They covered up the bullpen mounds. And then the pitchers stopped warming up. So you're already messing with their routines as they prepare for this game. Too. And, the, and the one thing that neither team wants, but particularly the Houston Astros, they do not want to lose Andy Pettit as their starter. I think the White Sox, because they're a bit deeper, Andy Pettit in postseason play, he has honed his skills in the Bronx. His eighth start as the game two pitcher in postseason play, and he has done very, very well. Yeah, those numbers in that terrific ERA after his team lost a game one during postseason play, that's what he's done in game two. That's happened with the Yankees, and let's talk Pettit for a second. I saw Andy Pettit in his first start of the year, and we talked to Phil Garner about Andy before this game, and in that game, his first start out, he was throwing 84 to 86 miles an hour. His arm has gotten stronger as the year has gone on, and now he, in that last NLCS game, was hitting 92, 93 miles per hour on the radar gun. 
And Phil Garner says that's not all good with Andy Pettit. And I think the one problem that he poses for the White Sox is that there are very few pitchers like him in the American League. A guy who depends on that cutter down and into right handed hitters. And of course, it's a very cold night. We'll see how the White Sox handle it. Well, you uh, you talk about Andy Pettit. You think about their bullpen, Brad Lidge, for an extended amount of time tonight. As Kevin Kennedy said, and I think we agree, this is a game the Astros need to win. They don't want to go back to Houston down two games to nothing. For more on the weather as we prepare for game two, let's go back down to Chris Myers. Joe and Tim, I'm down by the White Sox dugout. What happened moments ago was it was a heavier band of showers, and that's how it had spent most of the day. Light rain, a little heavier drizzle, nothing extremely heavy, which is why they're going to try and play this game. So Roger Bosser, the crew chief, head groundskeeper here, I should say, had him cover or start to put the tarp on the outfield. Then the rain let up a little bit. So Jimmy Lee Solomon, executive uh, vice president of baseball operations, came out and said, if the rain's lightening up, let's get the tarp off. Let's start the game. So we may have this uh, throughout this game where there will be intermittent showers that are a little bit heavier. But again, according to the radar, the grounds crew and baseball officials, they think they're going to be able to play through this throughout the evening. And of course, the players are the players in both dugouts are anxious and anticipating and a little bit unsure. But right now we're on to play. And Joe, you do get wet in high definition. <laughs> and it looks fantastic falling off your face, Chris. Uh, let's talk about the White Sox. Everybody, including us, wondered last night, how are the White Sox bullpenners going to come out after not really working at all in the ALCS, two-thirds of an inning? And I guess with Neil Kotz and Bobby Jenks doing what they did last night, they put any White Sox fans' fears to rest with the way they pitched. All White Sox fans familiar with what the starters did in the LCS, four straight complete games. But last night, coming into the game, in the eighth inning with runners on at first and third and nobody out, Neil Cox facing Morgan Innsberg. High fastball, got him. Mike Lamb, got him. Ozzie Guillen wants the big guy, the biggest guy in the bullpen. Comes in, Bobby Jinks. Strikes out Jeff Bagwell with runners on at first and third. And then in the ninth inning, no contest as Jason Lane goes down on the curve and Adam Everett on the high fastball. These two bullpens going to be such a big part of this World Series as we move through it. Well, even when you talk about the White Sox, you can't get away from the big four and their rotation. And they're starring on a television set near you. Jose Contreras. This Cuban specialty is a nasty forkball. Mark Burley. Time is of the essence for this speed demon. John Garland. A cool, laid-back stud with style. Freddy Garcia. This veteran brings playoff experience. Can these four start a new beginning for the Southside faithful? The rotation. Now playing in select cities. Chicago and Houston. The World Series on Fox is sponsored by Mitsubishi, driven to thrill by the City Simplicity Credit Card, the card that treats you right. By Sprint, Sprint, yes you can. And by AOL, want a better internet? You belong at AOL. It is U.S. Cellular Field. It is game two. It is a temperature of 45 degrees, although I swear it's colder. Baseball fans, grab a cold, fresh Budweiser. It's game time. And with that being said, we take a look at the Houston Astros starting lineup. A little different tonight for game two than they brought there in game one. Starting lineup for Houston is sponsored by City. Biggio lead it off at second base. Tavares had a nice night last night. He's batting second and center. Lance Berkman hits third at first. Morgan Ensberg is at third batting cleanup. Jeff Bagwell the DH moves up in the order. Jason Lane is in right and Chris Burke in left. Brad Osmus does the catching and Adam Everett is the shortstop batting in the nine spot. The rain is stopped. That's good news when you have face paint. And let's take a look at how the White Sox cover the field. It's brought to you by State Farm. In the outfield, but Sednick in left, Rowland in center, Jermaine Dye in right. Third baseman is Creedy. He's making a name for himself this October. Uribe is short. Aguchi is second, and Canerco at first with A.J. Pierzynski, the catcher. And Mark Burley, the left-hander, who this season, including the postseason, is 12-2 here at home. 
And as Jeannie and Kevin talked about, likes to work fast, is on the mound for the White Sox. Take a look at the numbers for Mark. A 16-game winner during the regular season. Third best ERA in the AL at 3.12. And as far as innings pitched, 236.2. That was the top number in the league. And he trots out to work. And he is about as steady as they come among big league pitchers. He gives you innings and he gives you all he's got. Scott in report. Successful innings in this ball club. No trips to the refrigerator, folks. He works very, very fast. He's a homebody, the lowest earned run average at home in the American League, a 2.48 ERA. And that rare, rarely do you see a scouting report with the claw on it. Well, that's his changeup. He chokes the fastball with all four fingers and his thumb. Scooter, does he have the claw grip? I don't think so, but he has more info on the changeup. Hello, friends. It's Scooter. A changeup is just another word for a slow ball. While the batter is looking for a real fast pitch, the pitcher throws me really, really slow. And this is how he throws it really, really slow. Mark Burley with that changeup. It's, it's odd. A lot of guys have the circle change. You, of course, last night featured two pitchers throwing the splitter fork ball for Contreras but you'll see uh, some Houston hitters that are out in front if Burley's changeup is on tonight. So they said it would start on time and they are only four minutes tardy. It's better than I did morning after morning in high school. They're close enough and Biggio is first up for the Astros. Biggio, Tavares and then Perkman if anybody gets on Morgan Ensberg, and wouldn't the Astros love to jump out in front and give Andy Pettit a little breathing room here at the start of game two. Strike one. And Joe, because Vizio stands so close to the plate, I think he's the guy in the Astro lineup that's going to give Burley the most trouble tonight. He takes that outside pitch like that away from Mark. So he's your pick to click here yeah. early. Take the click. Biggio clicks one into center. Popped it up. Rowan. One away. And you know, we talk about don't go to the refrigerator and he pitches like he's double parked and all that with regard to Burley, but something that's kind of spread across this pitching staff is not thinking too much. Get the ball, know what you want to do with it and cut it loose and Burley has kind of put that on a lot of his fellow starters in the entire attitude and approaches change throughout this rotation. Do your thinking before the game not during the game. Strike one over the outside corner to Willie Tavares. This rookie is hitting 387 during the postseason. A terrific figure last night had a pair of doubles late in the game. As far as rookies go. Pepper Martin hit 500 in 1931 for the St. Louis Cardinals. Here's a ground ball to the right side. On a little punt, two out. Ichiro hit 421 in 2001. And then there's Tavares hitting 387. But he's 0 for 1 tonight. And there's two out, nobody on here in the first. There's a good idea by Tavares. Most left-handers fall toward the third base side of the diamond. But Burley's not a hard thrower. So he squares up once he throws the ball and makes plays like that. You can see uh, his follow through square, squaring up to the plate to get to Barris. Now it's Berkman. Lance last night, two hits, two RBIs. Starts Berkman off of the fastball inside. Berkman's last hit last night came right handed off Neil Cotts. And then you know the rest. Cotts proceeded to strike out Ensberg and Lamb. On came Bobby Jenks. He struck out Bagwell. And then two of the three he faced in the ninth. And it was a 5 3 win. Off the end of the bat, strike two. There's Neil Cotts. When you have Burley on the mound, 
this season his average time of game when he starts two and a half hours the regular season average of 247 and in the postseason just over three hours minute half inning no score the World Series on Fox is sponsored by Bud Light smooth and refreshing Bud Light great taste for your great times Andy Pettit is making his 34th career postseason start that's the most ever these extra rounds of playoffs he is in the top spot in Major League Baseball history in that category but Zednik takes a strike Andy Pettit won 17 games for Houston this season and was the pitcher of the month during September. He was terrific in helping to get the Houston Astros into the postseason as the wild card. That's on the inside corner. It's 0-2. In many ways, Andy Pettit had his best year. His best year as far as earned run average is concerned, second to Roger Clemens in that department. And our scouting report on Andy, the cut fastball, an unusual look to White Sox hitters. Cutter on a cold night. Expect those right-handed hitters to try to get the bad head out against that cutting fastball. And nobody controls the running game better. Which is important when you're taking on a White Sox team with guys like Bud Sednick and Iguchi and Rowan, even Creedy Uribe. They like to get things going on the bases once they get on. One ball, two strikes. Two and two. Andy Pettit last year made only 15 starts before he had season ending elbow surgery. He was on the DL three times in his first season in a Houston uniform. But he more than made up for it here in 2005. And he jams the heck out of Putsednik, who just fights it off. Fastballs in prevent the left-hander from diving out over the plate. Putsednik last night, two hits. Five at-bats with an RBI. And that'll get out of play. So we saw this last night against Clemens and really anybody else the Astros had out there. On Sednik, not afraid to get to two strikes and then battling. And now he's in the mode to try to make Pettit work for this first out. Seventh pitch of this at bat coming from Pettit. And now the count's full. Burley only threw 10 pitches in the top of this inning. Gap in right center. That's where Pot said it triple last night for the last White Sox run. On a line into right. Nice catch by Lane as that ball stayed in the air for a long time. Pot Sednik with a good at bat. Hit it hard. But he's the first out. Starting lineup for Chicago is sponsored by City. Pot Sednik, you know, a Gucci, then die. Canerco, Everett, and Rowan in the middle. Kierzynski, Creedy, and Uribe in the bottom three. See what the bottom of the order did in game one for Chicago. The home run belonged to Creedy. Aguchi takes the ball. Tadahito last night 0 for 5, and in this postseason, 6 out of 34. Two and zero. Eleventh World Series start for Andy Pettit. 
that ties him with Christy Mathewson in baseball history and those two are number two all time behind Whitey Ford. A long time Yankees started 22 World Series games. And time is called prior to the pitch. So there's Pettit's concentration as he just peeks over the edge of his glove under the bill of his cap. Time was called, still delivered it. The count two and one. Two and two, and Aguchi not happy with that call. Jeff Nelson is the home plate umpire. <laughs> Congratulations. That's 92 great. years. Pettit fell behind 2 0, came back to strike out at Gucci, two down, and here's the defense. After the look again at the swing and miss by Aguchi. See how the Astros cover the field. It's brought to you by State Farm in the outfield. Burke is in left tonight. It's the change in this lineup. Tavares in center and Lane is in right. Ensberg, Everett, Biggio, Berkman. Osmus doing the catching. Here's Dye, who homered in the first last night. Joe, the last two pitches, the strikeout to Aguchi and the first strike to die. That's Andy Pettit at his best. That's the cut fastball in on the corner at the knees. One ball, one strike. Hard hit, base hit. Jermaine Dye started out last night's ball game in the first inning with a home run. That was a changeup, low and away. Dye stays on it, hammers it to center for the first hit of the ball game. Now it's Canerco. This White Sox team has outscored the opposition 13 to 2 in the first inning, and when they've scored first this postseason, they're 7 and 0. Canerco, two hits, a couple of singles in game one. That drops in for strike one. Dye and Berkman will have their eyes peeled watching that pickoff move that Andy Pettit possesses. That's in at the knees, and it's 0-2. Yeah, you have to be very cautious at first base. Only nine National League runners tried to steal against Andy Pettit this year. Five made it. He just shuts down the running game. The fact that Mark Burley does the same thing on the other side. Canerco wouldn't go after it. Ball one. Canerco is 29 years old, came up through the Dodgers organization, has had back-to-back -back 40 home run seasons, and he is a free agent to be at the end of the year. left-handers moves if they're good they're balk moves very very close to balking and he knows that but he has honed it to precision throughout his career off the top railing of the dugout for the White Sox and up into the crowd and Erica way out in front the count still one and two Ball with 21 RBIs in his last 24 games overall, and his dad was quoted in the Chicago Tribune a couple of days ago as saying the White Sox had all year to talk to him about a deal. He's in the prime of his career, and it's time for him to cash in. Will it be staying with the White Sox or moving on during the ALCS? There's a ton of speculation that he could end up as an L.A. Angel next year to provide some right-handed pop and some protection for Guerrero. Right now he's trying to bring a world championship 
to the south side of Chicago and Austin is going to go out and talk to the veteran. Normally catchers and pitchers don't have problems with signs unless there's a runner on at second base. It is unusual. Evidently just a difference in philosophy. What they want to do with Canerco. He stared off the fastball away and then the slider inside. And then as you said he went out to make sure. Pitchers and catchers disagree. Come on. Never happened. Yeah. One ball, two strikes, one on, two out. Got him on the outside corner, and Pettit gets through a scoreless first. It's been a while. This young lady was 46 years old 46 years ago in 1959, the last time the Sox were in the series. We're in Chicago, no score after one. Here's a shot into left field off the bat of Ensberg and gone. A home run for Houston. First pitch swinging. Burley delivered it. Ensberg lost it. And it's one to nothing. Houston in the second. Just like that, the Astros have their first lead in this series. Morgan Innsberg with 36 home runs on the season. His second career postseason home run. And it looked like he went up there looking for a fastball in the middle of the plate. He got it, and he did not miss it. Again, a guy who hit only 10 last year. 36 this season was an all-star and Bagwell went up there ready to rip. Here's what it looked like. Come on. Bagwell clunks one to third. Tough play for Creedy. Goes on the run for out number one. Morgan Ensberg is telling his friends in the dugout what it was like to hit a World Series home run. Mike Lamb knows what it feels like. He did it last night. Biggest increase with that home run swing from a year ago in Major League Baseball in 2005. Here's Lane. He's on that list too. Jason hit only four home runs last year at over 100 at bats and this year hit 26. Deep in game six, the clincher in St. Louis in the NLCS. And he's on with one out. So a homer, a ground out, a base hit. Burke is coming up in our Lunesta trivia question. Who was the last pitcher to start the All-Star game and a World Series game in the same season? Burley was the starter and winner for the American League this year. Here's Chris Burke. Want to crawl out onto the ledge and fire a guess off at that? I have nothing. Uh, yeah, I don't either. We'll just sit and wait with everybody else. Burke takes a ball high. Chris homered in game four to win that Divisional series against Atlanta and then hit a two run shot off Chris Carpenter in game one of the National League Championship Series. A lot of things that Phil Garner can do now. The hit and run is one. Little pop up, shallow right, might drop. Die a long run and he's there for out number two. with a little glance out into right field looking at Dye who covered a lot of ground and here's Osmus with one on two down. Brad last night had a hit for the postseason has 12 hits. And these Astros have gone hockey on us and they're all growing postseason beards. Ball one high from Burley. 
Astros resemble a troop of Shakespearean actors. <laughs> and a government major is at the plate. At Dartmouth, no less. So an Ivy Leaguer is Brad Osmus. He will don the tools of intelligence in the bottom of the second when he catches Andy Pettit. Too far inside. 2 0. Burley from St. Charles, Missouri, 27 year old left hander. 6 2 2 20. 2 0 so far this postseason. A win in the division series against the Red Sox. And a win in the ALCS game. Two went all nine. Lane is running. A throw down by Pierzynski is late. The stolen base for Houston. It's Osmus an easier RBI chance. Jason Lane guessed and guessed right. The throw to the third base side, but even a good throw doesn't get it. Good jump by Lane. Lane only stole six during the regular season. He gets his first to the postseason. And this crowd on this cold, damp night trying to get some life for Burley to help him get out of this second. Two and two. Did not go. And it's a full count. Yeah, after the changeup, Burley tried to come inside with the fastball. And Osman, Osmus held. Yeah, I think he held up. I think that was a good call. First base umpire, Jerry Lane. Burley's 3 2. Slow roller, tough play. Creedy will let it go. It's going to stay fair. We talked to Garner before the game about that third baseline, and I talked to Biggio about it as well, and he said, this stadium and this field is notorious for that third baseline that slopes back in toward the field of play, as opposed to it getting near the line and just falling off and rolling foul. Greedy, who's played here and knows this field, knew that thing was not going to move across the line. So that is a little home field disadvantage for the White Sox on that ball. Here's Adam Everett, first and third, two out. His Astros up one zip. Ball one. Far Everett this postseason 0 for 11 with runners in scoring position. Astros looking for more and trying to get one out of their number nine spot. Good pitch from Burley. There really no need to look down at third base coach Doug Manzolino now with two out. Really nothing on. You don't hit and run with two outs. And if a guy is going, you're going to protect him. He'll be swinging the bat. Joe's bunt. He got Pierzynski's attention. And the rare strike call on a drop pitch. That's what happens when that bat is in line with the ball. Catcher really can't see it real well. Ball hit the heel of the glove and he dropped it. First and third, two out. A run home. One ball, two strikes on Everett. The inning started with Morgan Ensberg taking the first pitch out. Houston takes a second inning lead in game two. 
Carl Everett, who was once traded for Adam Everett, digs his way in at the plate. Last night, Carl had a hit. He's the DH, batting right-handed. Rowan will follow, and then Pierzynski, ball one from Pettit. One to nothing, Houston leads on the Ensberg home run. One and one. What we were talking about during our open, Tim, was that as the left arm of Andy Pettit has gotten stronger as the year has gone on, his velocity has gone up. And even though he can now get it up there at 92 miles per hour again, Phil Garner and the Houston Astros don't really want him to throw that hard. They'd like him to have a little more natural movement and not be so amped up and pitch as opposed to try to blow hitters away. Well, it's more important for a guy who makes his living inside the right-handers to have more velocity. Like a guy like Burley, for instance, who works away to right-handers doesn't necessarily need that type of velocity. That's a third strikeout already for Pettit. And he had Everett way out in front. Yeah, again, this is vintage Andy Pettit. The cut fastball out of the strike zone. You have to be very, very patient with Andy, but of course with two strikes, you can't be. But here's a guy digging it, Aaron Rowan, who has reached base via hit or a walk in every postseason game so far for the White Sox. Ball one. Ozzie Guillen has not tinkered with his lineup one bit. That includes the red hot Joe Creedy staying in the number eight spot. Fights it off, fouls it off. One ball, one strike. In the scouting report, we were talking about a cutter on a cold night. That was a cutter on a cold night. Jamming Rowan. Right on the hands. Here's a 1-1. One -one. Ripped right through Ensberg. And with one out, the White Sox have their second base runner of the night. It will probably go as a base hit. A bad hop on Ensberg. Ball hit very, very hard by Rowan. Here's A.J. Pierzynski. Last night had a hit, scored two runs, drove in a run. But in his postseason career, in 28 at bats, he's hitting 143 against left handed pitching. A check on Rowan, who's stolen one base this postseason, 16 during the regular year. Astros leading one to nothing, and Pierzynski hits it in the air to left. Back is Burke at the wall. It's off the wall. And the runners will have to end up at first and second for the White Sox. Burke, who is new to the outfield, got back there, didn't know exactly where he was, and that ball hit midway up the wall and left. Joe, he was not the only guy who didn't know where he was. Aaron Rowan has got to be at least halfway, primarily down to second base on that ball. He came back to tag up. In fact, Pierzynski, had he been running hard, would have passed Rowan. This ball hitting in the middle of the fence. Had Rowan been to second base, he goes at least to third. But watch, he stops and comes back to first. Pierzynski sees him. Rowan even looking back at Pazinski, that's why Aaron only got to second base, but he has got to be on third with less than two outs. That is a bad base running decision by Aaron Rowan. Now Creedy, runners on at first and second with one out. And a fly ball down the right field line. It is a fair ball. Rowan will score. Pierzynski will go to third. It's a tie game.
So Roland does score, but this cost temporarily cost the White Sox a run because Brzezinski would have been on second base, Rowan on third. This would have, would have played it two. But Joe Greedy once again delivered. The only thing I can think of as far as Rowan is concerned is by going back to the bag and the way Burke's body was, he may have shielded the ball from Rowan from his spot at first base. And there could have been a moment where he didn't see the ball and just assumed that the ball was caught. Yeah, but if, if an outfielder, if, if the ball is close to either going out of the park or hitting the fence, you have got to be either halfway or down to the bag. You can't take the chance of coming back and tagging up, as Rowan did. Rowan scores on the hit by Creedy, and now Juan Uribe, the number nine man in the order, steps in with a go-ahead run at third. Runner on at first, and he pops it up. Out goes Biggio. The second baseman is there, bobbles it, drops it. Pierzynski will score. Throw to second for the force out. Two out in the inning. And the White Sox lead two to one. Pierzynski with great base running. Right. Puts the White Sox up, and the Astros in the end get the force out at second base. Why was Pierzynski in the right position? because he was toward halfway. You don't go back and tag up on the ball. You know you're not going to score. So he was off the bag at third, scores when the ball hits the ground, and it's a fielder's choice and an RBI. See, Krasinski didn't go back to tag up. He's about halfway, scores easily once the ball is dropped in shallow right field. Pretty understandably, is forced at second. Now it's Uribe taking off with a good jump. Throw down. He is safe. Stolen base for Juan Uribe is first of the postseason. Guessing right was Uribe. Again, as Tim said, and that ball hit by Juan Uribe, it goes as a fielder's choice. An RBI to put out 9 6 on the force at second. And then the stolen base by Uribe, and Bonsednik waits and grounds to the first baseman a fair ball, and this inning is over. Astros got one, the White Sox come back with two. Third inning, game two, two to one, Chicago. It's two to one White Sox now third inning two defensive misplays by the Astros in the bottom of the second one by Biggio who's at the plate leading off Tavares and Berkman will follow and that's strike two slap foul off to the right. So Burke who came up as an infielder now to get his bat in the lineup they have him in the outfield. Did not look good on the ball hit by Pierzynski missed it by a couple of feet. And in the end, the White Sox get their two runs and lead by one. As we play in the third, there's ball one outside to Biggio, one and two. Great fly to center his first time up. Reaching for it, grounds to Creedy. One away. Down to the game with Rowan wearing the microphone, trying to explain his base running. Hey, that's the right play on that, isn't it? You don't know if to catch it or not. So. Well, I figured he hit it so high, he's either going to catch it or it's going to go over the fence. So I'm trying to tag to get in spot position. That's it. That's all you can do. I don't agree with Ozzy. Don't agree with Aaron Rowan. You know, if, if Chris Burke is squaring up on the ball in left field, that's a different thing. But the left side of his body was actually facing home, and you can make a case that he was turned toward home plate. He missed the ball by five feet. Here's another extra base hit for Tavares. He had two doubles last night. He'll make it to second and now turn it on and try to get to third. The relay by Uribe, too late. And it's a one-out triple for Willie Tavares. Three extra base hits and just over a game in this World Series. Excellent base running with one out by Tavares. Taking a chance, and that's when you want to take a chance. Jermaine Dye does everything he can, but Tavares just outruns the ball and the throw. So now the tying run is at third with one out. 
And Berkman is at the plate. He struck out his first time up. Two to one, Chicago out in front here in the third. Berkman checked it, ball one. You can understand Ozzie Guillen's explanation to Aaron Rowan. I mean, what are you going to say in a situation like that? More, more or less pacifying Aaron. Berkman flies one into center field. Rowan will make the grab. Tavares will tag and come to the plate to tie the game. So with a catch by Aaron Rowan in center, Tavares scoring easily with that great speed, and we go back to that ball hit by Pierzynski. When an outfielder is going that hard toward the fence with the left side of his body turned toward home and then his back to home, there's no way he makes the catch. I mean, it's really rather rudimentary that you go at least halfway on a ball like that, and perhaps some guys say even as far as second base, because if Chris Burke did make the catch, he can't gather himself and throw the ball back to first to throw behind the runner. There's a strike to Ensberg, who homered his first time up, and the count evens at a ball and a strike. A one-out triple by Tavares, the sack fly by Berkman. And now it's a one-ball, two-strike count on Ensberg. Foul ball. Bagwell on deck. Two and two. Got him looking. Third strikeout for Burley. He can move. Willie Tavares legging out a one out triple. Scores to tie it. 2 2. Bottom of the third. Bank of America game summary. We're in the bottom of the third. Ensberg went deep. The Astros had the lead. Pettit making the start. Has 34 career postseason starts. Creedy with another base hit was on that list. A little flip single into right. For the first run of the night for the White Sox. And then a ball off the glove of Biggio on a pop fly hit by Uribe. Put the White Sox out in front. Top of the third inning, a sack fly by Berkman after a one-out triple by Tavares, and it's 2-2. With the two, three, and four hitters now for the White Sox. Aguchi hits one down the left field line. Chris Burke over to cut it off, and Tadahito Aguchi has a leadoff single. Our Lunestia trivia question, which Tim and I had absolutely no chance at even trying a guess the last pitcher to start the all-star game and a world series game in the same season both clemens and johnson opposed each other in the all-star game and then went at it in the world series back in 2001 congratulations to those of you who got it you are better than us one on nobody out jermaine dies single his first time up takes the ball And now Lance Berkman, the first baseman, is going to come over and talk to Pettit, who will no doubt keep a close eye on Aguchi, who stole 15 bases during the regular season. Lance Berkman talking to Andy about his move. It is very difficult. You brought that up a couple of innings ago. It's very difficult with a runner on at first base if you're a first baseman. You have to be very alert. Die hits one down the left field line. It is 
foul. Cutter inside. It's one of the problems right-handed hitters have. If you hit it well, you often pull it foul. The box track in off the plate. You got good wood on it, but a foul ball. One ball, one strike on Die. Homered last night. Already has a single tonight. Good pitch by Pettit. 73 miles per hour. One ball, two strikes. Andy Pettit, a winner in game one of the division series at Atlanta. Lost game one of the NLCS. And no decision in game five. That was the Albert Pujols night. With a two out, three run home run in the top of the ninth inning to win it for St. Louis, get the series back to Bush Stadium, and then Roy Oswalt took things into his own hands. And here Tim Raines yelling out. Raines, one of the best base stealers to come along in the last 25, 30 years is reading the move of Andy Pettit and might have as good a shot at reading it as a Gucci or anybody else on base for the White Sox. You can hear Reigns is reading it better than a Gucci. Back, 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 back. Four eyes are better than two. Back, back, back. Over 800 career stolen bases for Tim Raines. Part of those running expos back in the early 80s. Two balls, two strikes on Jermaine Dye. Still two and two. On deck is Kinnair going then Everett. When Tim Raines was playing, he was indestructible. His nickname was The Rock. And he had his first son, and his son's nickname was Little Rock. <laughs> they did not live in Arkansas. No. 2-2. Two -two. Full count, good at bat by Dye. I think he runs here, but you have to make sure Pettit goes home. Similar to a hit and run play. You must make sure he goes home. Takes off, shattered bat, and Berkman's only play is to first. Every half inning, Tim Raines, when he comes out to take his spot, Runs down the first baseline and lets the opposing infielder, in this case Biggio, try to throw him out. He was doing it against the Angels, and I kept wondering every half inning, is he driving them nuts out there right now? Biggio, you saw he had a hand warmer dangling out of his mouth when he was taking ground balls before the start of this bottom of third. That. His glove went cold on him in the second. On that little pop up hit by Uribe. Go ahead, run it second. One out. Bottom of the third inning. 2 2 game, and here is Canerco. Drove in 100 during the regular season, has 11 during the postseason. Good pitch by Pettit, kept it down and away. This is the same pitch on which Andy Pettit struck out Canerco his first time up. Even though it was a call strike, perhaps a little better pitch. Oh, and two. Bill Garner was telling us before the game that Andy Pettit has a great read of right-handed hitters. If he thinks they're looking for that cut fastball inside, he'll go away. And he has a great feel whether to go away 
are inside with his pitches. However, for as good as he is at holding runners close and shutting down a running game when a guy's at first, you see some base runners take advantage of him when they're at second. That's 0 and 2, and Canerco gets a piece. So Iguchi is still a threat to go down at second base with one out here in this third inning. Last inning, Uribe stole second on the first move that Pettit made. But then was left there when Bunsednik grounded out. Almost know Gucci's going nowhere when he's that far out of the baseline. He's about five feet behind the baseline. The good base runners will start there and then go into the baseline. But they're, you know, they, that straight line between two points being the shortest distance. Yes. Two and two on Canerco. The good base runners start from out there and then they go into the line. They don't stay back there. So with the Gucci doing that, the chances of stealing third are remote. Gucci well schooled in the fundamentals of baseball in Japan. Great first year with the White Sox, and he's the go ahead run at second with one out. To the right side for Piggio. Two down. And Aguchi's at third with Everett coming up. Everett struck out his first time. For the year 2005, regular and postseason, Everett is at 304 with runners in scoring position. He has a Gucci at third, two down in a tie game. Ties up Everett down and in. Strike one. Good play by Brad Osmus on the breaking ball in the dirt. Especially Tim considering where he started he was set up so high even though he called for a breaking ball and then he got down and blocked strike one. Well the one thing the catchers do they anticipate the breaking ball being in the dirt so they go down with it. That's what Osmus did. Another skipper in there and it's one and one. Everett with 87 runs batted in in 2005 for the White Sox. So far, just three in the postseason. Ozzie Guillen hasn't changed a thing. He's had the same lineup, the same spots in the batting order throughout the postseason. Here's a 1 1. Hard hit. Diving stop by Ensberg gets up, inning over. Good play by Morgan Ensberg to keep it a 2-2 game. We go to the fourth, game two. White Sox up one game to nothing. We're tied 2-2. The World Series on Fox is sponsored by DHL, delivering America's pastime on time. By State Farm, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. By new M3 Power from Gillette. Feel the power of the world's best shave by Chevy. Chevy and baseball, they just go together. An American revolution. First pitch is strike to Bagwell. Underway in the fourth inning. Bagwell, Lane, and Burke for Houston. 2-2 score. And it's 0-2. Bagwell with that bad right shoulder. Takes one high for ball one. 
in his career 449 home runs. Burley trying to take advantage of that going up the ladder. Back toward us still one and two and again a high delivery from the Chicago left hander. Most games before their first World Series appearance since 1903 Biggio at the top of the list. His longtime teammate Bagwell number three. Bonds between them two and two. Judging from the way Jeff has been swinging both last night and tonight it appears that the ball down in the strike zone is more his pitch now than the ball up in the strike zone. Hard hit right side. What a pitch by Aguchi. One out. Nicely done on the in-between hop. Shaded more up the middle. Bagwell hit it hard, but Aguchi picked it. Three-time Gold Glove Award winner. Pacific League Japan and with one out here is Jason Lane who singled stole a base his first time. Joe we talked about it before the games uh, the last couple of nights how odd it is for Jason Lane to throw left handed and bat right handed. The pepper in the right side of the infield Canerco takes it two down Chris Myers you're up. Hi, Joe. We know Houston's deep in the heart of Texas. I, I talked to people here in Chicago to try to get a better understanding of the whole South Sider and North Side thing, and Madison Avenue is the dividing line. And they say it's a cultural, social, maybe even economical difference, but it's more blue collar. That's what they tell you on the South Side where the White Sox are. And I did talk to Ultimate Cup fan Bill Murray by telephone. And he says he's actually rooting for the White Sox because Ozzie Guillen played with a lot of uh, a fun attitude. He manages that way. Murray's dad was a Cubs fan, but his grandfather was a White Sox fan, but no confusion. He wants Chicago to win a World Series. And I, I talked to him by phone, and I asked him if he had done anything since Ghostbusters, and he hung up on me. Chris, be sure to bend over and pick up that name you just dropped. Talking to Bill Murray. It's the kind of company that Chris Myers keeps. They got to hang around Chris more. Sawed off is Burke, and that's three ground ball outs here in the fourth. Bottom of the fourth. 2-2 two -two game. Astros and Sox. We're in the bottom of the fourth inning. Aaron Rowan is first up. Singled, scored a run. Had an adventure on the bases, but finally got home. Kurzinski will follow. And then Creedy. 2-2 two -two game, and Andy Pettit misses upstairs. Ball one. So yet again, another postseason game for the White Sox, and Rowan reached base, as he did in the second. back last night Chicago's own Liz Fair performed God Bless America during the seventh inning stretch and tonight the best trumpet player in the land Chris Bode will perform look forward to that here's a 1 1 pitch Rowan good rip strike two had a chance to visit with Jim Hickey the pitching coach of these Astros and we will try to get you that interview after Rowan does something to start this fourth. On one and two. Rowan pops it up. Shallow right center. A long run for Lane. He's there. One down. Here's Jim Hickey. Pitching coach for Houston. Well, Jim Hickey, is it uh, too simplistic to say as a pitching coach when you got a guy like Andy Pettit on the mound, you sit back and watch? Uh, what do you? What's your normal in-game routine with a guy like Pettit with all that experience? Well, I'd say that's a little bit too simplistic. Yeah, he has a couple of things that he wants for you to keep an eye on. 
uh, and we do. He has a tendency sometimes, you know, he gets a little bit of a jam to maybe go a little bit too hard, and you got to back him off a little bit sometimes. But, you know, not quite as complicated as some of the other people, but absolutely some things you need to keep an eye on. I made a mention of it earlier that in the beginning of the year, his velocity was nowhere near what it is right now. And talking to Phil Garner, he said it's not always good for him to get the fastball up there at 92 miles per hour. You agree? I agree, absolutely. Uh, he pitched some of the best ball games that we've seen out of him at 84 and 85 miles an hour. Uh, but that being said, also, he's had some outstanding ball games where he's been in that 89 and 91 mile an hour range. The thing that I like uh, personally about the increased velocity is the cutter is a little bit better, a little bit sharper, so it becomes more of a swing and a miss pitch when he's got the better velocity. Last quick question. What's the latest on Roger Clemens? Um, I'm not sure to tell you the truth. I haven't talked with the medical people uh, today at all, but uh, we're just taking it day to day, and uh, you know, we're, we're going to take it as if he's going to make his start, and if things change, we'll uh, adjust accordingly. Once again, thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you. Very well-spoken pitching coach of the Houston Astros, Jim Hickey, and what a job he has done blending the young with the, say, veteran, not old, veteran in this Houston pitching staff. Here's a 2-1 to Brzezinski. Stayed in on him, and the count 2-2. Two two. Interesting uh, the comments about Andy Pettit. When he gets in trouble, sometimes he wants to go harder. I remember a comment by Joe Torrey of the Yankees earlier this year. He said, Greg Maddox, when he gets in trouble, should be really the ideal pitcher to follow because he goes softer and not harder when he's in trouble. Here's a 2-2. A strikeout for Pettit. That's his fourth of the night. And Pierzynski is the second out here in the bottom of the fourth. Good breaking ball. Maybe the best breaking ball Andy Pettit has thrown in the game. You can see... The arc started out as a strike and ended up off the plate. This date of baseball history, October 23rd, 1945, Dodgers president Branch Rickey announces that Jackie Robinson is signed to play with Brooklyn's AAA team in Montreal. The 26-year-old Negro League star will be the first black player to play for a major league organization since 1884. For more Major League Baseball information, log on to foxsports.com on MSN. Keyword... Budweiser. Creedy took a ball and now a strike. One and one. Jackie Robinson's number 42 retired across baseball. Creedy hits it a ton down the line and left. It is foul. We've seen two of those. The cutter inside to Jermaine Dye hit foul. Now the cutter inside to Joe Creedy hit foul. Once again, if you put good wood on the ball and you're a right-handed hitter, you're going to hit it foul, as Dye and Creedy have done. Here's a one-two. Skips in there. When he talked to Isaac Gian about Creedy, he said, you know, Earlier in the year, they had to start to change what their expectations were for Creedy. They knew he was going to be a gold glove type third baseman, but maybe not a fifth or sixth place hitter in this lineup. As you said, put him down in the lineup, let him settle in, do his thing, and let him get his confidence. And now the White Sox are reaping the benefits of that strategy because he seems to be the most confident hitter, maybe outside of Canerco, that the White Sox have in their lineup, and he's hitting eighth. He has 10 RBIs this postseason. Second to Canerco. Three hops to Everett. Off we go into the fifth inning here in Chicago. A cold, wet night. 2-2 score back after this from your local station. Downtown Chicago all lit up. The skyscrapers with messages for the Sox. Up one game to none on Houston. Series will shift to Texas with a travel day tomorrow and then game three on Tuesday night. You look at Burley, minutes first and then pitches next. Three minutes, roughly, 10 pitches in the first inning. Nine minutes, 17 pitches. Last inning, the fourth, thanks to some good defense. Three minutes, 11 pitches, and Osmus fights it off. He's in the hole 0 2. Seen both left handed pitchers. 
working the inside part of the plate and off the plate the right handed batters all night. I was thinking the same thing Joe it, it's atypical of Burley to pitch like Pettit. Burley's strength is away Pettit's strength is inside but tonight Burley has come inside a lot now away and he misses to Osmus ball one. Everett and then Biggio. Back inside one ball two strikes. That's what you get from Burley. Chews up innings. Yeah he works fast but he really can save your bullpen. Every fifth day. Two balls two strikes now. On Osmus who singled his first time up. Reaching for it, and that ball's foul and out of play. Earlier, you talked about uh, how Burley is from St. Charles, Missouri. He went to Francis How Howell North High, and was cut twice from his high school baseball team. A huge Cardinal fan growing up, and an admirer of Todd Worrell. This one, Creedy can't make the play on. He knocks it down, and Osmus is going to end up at second. Freedy got enough of it. It dribbled away, and with that, Osmus is two for two as he adds a double to his night. Show the three plays that Creedy made going to his right last night. He dives, the ball stays down under his glove. Good base running by Osmus to go to second. Creedy has to get up and then track the ball down. Osmus with a double to lead off the fifth inning. Come on, come on, come on, hey, come on, come on. Now what will Houston do with that leadoff double? Last night they wasted three chances late. Two of them on leadoff doubles by Tavares. I think you bunt here. That's what the White Sox are looking for. They're in on the corners and Everett drops it down. It is a, now they're going to say foul ball. The third base umpire is pointing into home plate saying that the ball came up and hit Everett for a foul ball. That's Gary Cedarstrom. The home plate umpire did not make that call. He was watching the play at first. And let's see if the ball came up and hit Everett. It glanced off his left thigh. Well, if it hits him in fair territory, he's out. But evidently, Gary Cedarstrom said that it hit him in the batter's box. I would agree. Yeah. Definitely still in the box. Yeah. And Ozzie Guillen is clarifying that right now. I think Ozzie's questioning that call uh, makes a lot of sense because from the dugout, the, the body of Adam Everett is between the ball and Ozzie Guillen. So he really can't tell whether it hit him in fair territory or not, but that ball did hit him in the box. Good call. So now Everett is back to the plate. No balls, one strike. Out at second, the go-ahead run Osmus, and that pitch up and away. Osmus is not a liability on the bases speed-wise. He's not fast, but he can get around the bases, and whereas with other catchers it might be an issue and a tougher base running play. He's got a decent-sized lead. A good bunt will get him to third, and now they switch off, and Everett fouls it away for strike two. On deck, Biggio. So Phil Garner got aggressive there on that last pitch and took the bunt away, and now with two strikes, Everett gets back in. Strikes out. Fourth strikeout for Burley. Now one of them bigger than that. Burley coming back inside as he has done a lot tonight. The fastball gets Adam Everett. So Everett can't get Osmus to third. At this point, it takes a hit. 
by Biggio and Craig is 0 for 2 tonight. He's fly to center grounded out to third. Everett now 0 for 13 with runners in scoring position during the postseason. Biggio takes the ball. Another shattered bat. Aguchi will play it on a bounce. Dangerous play, and he gets the out. Dangerous because you don't know what kind of spin that's going to have once it hits the dirt. Aguchi couldn't get there evidently, but he gets the out. Could not make the play in the air, so he makes it on the first hop. Meanwhile, Brad Osmus is not sure whether it's going to be caught either, and he has to hold at second base. A good play as it turned out by Aguchi. So now it's up to right now the hottest hitter for the Astros, at least in this series, Tavares. The rookie last night had two doubles. Tonight has a triple and scored a run to tie it back in the third on a sack fly by Berkman. Tavares doubled last night in the sixth and the eighth leading off and did not score. At the time it was a one run White Sox lead. Ball one. And Ozzie Guillen telling us before the game that when Tavares doubled to open the eighth inning, he was conceding that run, particularly after Berkman singled the left field. But the White Sox bullpenners struck out three Astros to end the inning. Three extra base hits his last four at bats. Double in the left center field. Double in the left center field. And tonight, slicing one down the right field line, sliding the third with a one out triple. Tie game, fifth inning. Tavares. Ball two. That is a Houston statistic. 182 with runners in scoring position and two outs this postseason for Phil Garner's team. Two and two. Garner, who won a ring with the 79 Pittsburgh Pirates, a We Are Family team. Involved in nine double plays as a second baseman and hit 500 against Baltimore. Stargell was the World Series MVP back in 79 in the Pirate win. Big performance by starter Jim Rooker in game five as the Pirates were down three games to one and came back to beat Baltimore. Phil Garner was an outstanding player. Double to start the inning. He's at second with two out. And Tavares reaches for it from the hole. Uribe can't make the out at first, and it's first and third for Berkman. Not with the speed of Tavares once the ball got past Creedy, the third baseman. Ball almost hit the runner. You had Creedy going for the ball, and Osmus coming right there. And you're right, once that ball got by Creedy, no way to get Tavares, an infield hit. Four out of six in this World Series is Tavares. And who would the Astros rather have at the plate than the guy up there now, Lance Berkman? Tore up his knee during the offseason. Started the year on the DL. Still drove home 82 runs and hit 293. Check on Tavares. The rookie with no steals this postseason. 34 during the regular year. It's risky to run in this situation with your RBI man up there. A base hit puts you out in front. He's 
not have a big lead and gets back easily. A little mist continues to fall and it picks up a little here at the top of the fifth. Berkman slaps one down the right field line foul. Fastball and on the hands of Lance Berkman. This is such a different game that Mark Burley has pitched than the game we did against the California Angels at legendary game two. And Burley was going to go back out there in the 10th inning had the game stayed tied one to one. But the pretty double made it two to one. As you take a look at Orlando Hernandez El Duque first and third two down for all the kids in our television audience when Tim said California Angels he's referring to the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Right. Right. I don't want any confusion on that. Were the California Angels, then the Anaheim Angels, and now uh, you're correct. Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Berkman hits it fair down the left field line, and the Astros are back out in front. In to score is Osmus. Tavares will score as the left fielder Potsednik has trouble with it. And it's 4 2 Houston here in the fifth. Lance Berkman delivers, and he has. A big two out hit down the left field line. It looked like a change up low and away and Berkman is just an outstanding hitter. Even had Scott Pitsednik come up with the ball. Rivera scores easily with his speed. Bill Garner the manager of the Astros. Sharon Willie around the bases. Vigio part of this inning. Not able to cash in on the double by Osmus to start the frame until Berkman saves it for Houston. It's ruled a two out two run double no error. You know Bud said they couldn't dig it out cleanly. And the inning continues with Ensberg at the plate. He's homer tonight and struck out. Ball one. Two extra base hits in this inning and four on the night for Houston. A tremendous swing by Lance Berkman here in game two with his Astros down. One game to none. And threatening to waste that leadoff double by Osmus. Two balls and a strike. Ball was down, but too much of the plate. Excellent hitter right there in Lance Berkman. This one is driven out to short off the end of the bat, caught by Uribe, and we are halfway through game two. Two runs on three hits for Houston. White Sox coming to bat, trailing the Astros 4-2. First pitch is over the outside corner for a strike, and we're underway in the bottom of the fifth. Uribe, then Pasednik, and then Aguchi. 9-1-2 and two for the White Sox. We're now trailing by two. Lane continues to fall, and that ball is fair. Down the left field line off the bat of Uribe, and he will cruise into second base with a leadoff double. Looks like a breaking ball in the middle of the plate. And Innsberg was playing even with the bag, and it just gets by Morgan. Just fair. Oribe, so who is having an excellent postseason, leads off with a double after Osmus led off with a double in the top half of the inning. Now, what do the White Sox do with it? Potsednik steps in there, 0 for 2. They're in on the corners of the infield for the Astros. And 
and a strike. But Zednik went after it. Let's talk Pettit. Tim McCarver, we talked coming on. If the Astros had to turn to somebody in game two, down one game to none, here's the guy with all of that postseason experience with New York. In the Bronx, and Andy Pettit has just been terrific throughout his career, and I think the Houston Astros are very, very comfortable with Andy Pettit on the mound. You couldn't have anybody better. Zednik pops it up into left center. Uribe will tag. Tavares has a good arm, and Uribe will hold. And there's an example of the good arm. So now Ponsednik does not advance the runner. And this rookie, Tavares, who bypassed Triple A, <laughs> made the jump from Double A, is showing it all here in this World Series. Runner at second, one out for Aguchi, who singled his last time up. Tavares coming to the White Sox from the Cleveland Indians. And in talking about during our pregame preparation and everything, you got to think that the Cleveland Indians and the drive they had in September really helped the White Sox. Almost hardened them to play in the postseason. And I think Isaac Guillen totally agrees with that. Yeah. You know, this was a team that at one point had an enormous lead of 15 games. It was whittled away at one point down to a game and a half. Everybody got a scare. And his team, Ozzie Gian's team, worked their way out of it and ended up the season blowing right through the Indians the final weekend, sweeping Cleveland after they had already clinched in Detroit. A 13 and 1 record, their last 14 games, 8 and 1 so far this postseason. It prepared them for this run. Osmus out to visit with Pettit with a count 2 and 0. In his career in the postseason, Andy Pettit, most starts all time, second most to John Smoltz and wins. 210 in the third innings, most all time postseason baseball. And again, all of that show you comes with the gigantic asterisk of extra rounds and more chances for guys like Pettit in this day and age compared to those who pitched prior to 1969 in divisional play. Bay at second, one out, 4 2 Houston in the fifth. 2 and 2 on Aguchi. Yeah, you think about it, those 210 innings in postseason play, Andy Pettit has pitched a season of postseason games and innings. He pitched 222 and a third during the regular season in 2005. Approaching that now in the postseason for his career. Tying run at the plate, 2-2 pitch, full count. A franchise history that dates back to 1962. For the Houston Astros, the year when they first started to play in the World Series for the first time. Down one game to nothing, leading game two, and Pettit as Uribe hung up. Talk about being a savvy veteran in the postseason. He ends up getting the out with only one throw. Andy Pettit did not panic at all, and he took one throw to get Uribe going back to second base for out number two. It's a hard play if you're the runner at second base because if the ball's through, you want to be on third. But Pettit running at the runner. You don't want to commit too soon. Runs it back towards second. And Uribe is out. Nicely done. Fielder's choice 1 6. What will this series tally be on Tuesday night in Houston? Our coverage begins at 8 Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. 7 Central Time. Central Time just keeps getting overlooked. These are two teams that play in the central time zone. And a matchup of John Garland and Roy Oswald. If you haven't seen Roy Oswald, you're in for a treat on Tuesday night. Garland was outstanding. Out is a Gucci to end the inning. Andy Pettit just picked off 
his ninth in his career in the postseason. Two assists to end the inning for Pettit. We go to the sixth. Houston up 4-2. Some beers are big on flavor. Some beers are easy to drink. But until now, no beer has offered at all. Budweiser Select starts with hand-picked American and Bavarian hops. Budweiser Select is brewed longer for a bold taste that finishes clean. With Budweiser Select, it all comes together. Expect everything. You challenged everything that came before you. And nothing looked or felt or sounded the same way again. That was you then. And the great thing is, that's still you now. We are the personal advisors of Ameriprise Financial, the next generation of American Express financial advisors. Because a generation as unique as this needs a new generation of personal financial planning. Sprint Business is reinventing the Yes Man, so you can say yes to business when and where it happens. Because business today happens everywhere. And now that Sprint and Nextel have come together, you can work more efficiently from almost anywhere and make your business more competitive. In fact, Sprint is now the number one wireless provider to business, so I guess you can call me a Yes Man. Although I prefer Yes Woman. With Sprint Business, you can make just about any place a workplace. Yes, you can. Look at this. This is great. Yeah. This is fantastic. Here it is. Introducing. It's new. It's the rage. It's the hot new item. People tell me it's great. That's cool. What's that? The new product that's sweeping the world. Yeah. Hippest thing. Thank you. What is it? It's a. Uh... Whatever it is, you can get it on eBay. Introducing the all-new Chevy Impala, available with a powerful 303 horsepower small block V8 that delivers a remarkable 28 miles per gallon highway. It's a whole new animal. Chevy Impala, an American revolution. The World Series on Fox is sponsored by Chevy. Chevy and baseball, they just go together. An American revolution. Let's go to the sixth, and Bagwell takes a strike over the inside corner. 4-2, the Astros on top, thanks to a two-out, two-run double by Lance Berkman. Hard hit, and caught by Creedy on a line, one out. So one down here in the top of the sixth. We're in a left-handed pitcher goes behind his left leg when that right foot goes behind the left leg he must go home you can see with Andy Pettit from if you're the runner at first it's almost impossible to tell whether he's going home or going to first but that's the balk move that we talked about earlier the left handers with the good move often will have that right foot go behind the left leg just a just a tag and this was no exception. It's a, it's a tough angle right there for us to see it, but you get the idea. There's a strike that drops in on 2-0. and oh. It's 2-1 and one now on Jason Lane. Andy Pettit made the good play on the Ooh. ball at third to get Uribe, and now he picks off a Gucci. Interesting look at last replay as Lane fouls it straight back. It's two and two. Aguchi popped up and immediately started to argue. And you thought initially maybe he's arguing about the move. Uh huh. But you wonder if Aguchi got the hand back on the bag, or if Berkman ever got his glove on the arm of Tadahito Aguchi. Strikeout for Burley, number five on the night. Game summary, Morgan Ensberg went deep in the second. His first home run of this postseason hit 36 during the regular year. Creedy 
Another night, another RBI. Berkman, though, the big swing of the night. The two out, two run double last inning. Burley misses outside with ball one to Burke. This is one of the more pleasant clubhouses to walk into, the Houston Astros. Yeah, they are. And they've got so many veterans that have been around. And if you talk to Phil Garner, he'll say, even when it looked like we were finished, our veterans didn't give up. Our young guys didn't know any better. And they just kept playing hard. And before you knew it, there they were leading the wild card. And they clinched on the final day of the regular season. But guys like Biggio and Berkman and Bagwell fighting to get back and come back from that surgery. Clemens and Pettit. They kept this team going. Two and two on Burke. Yeah, we talked about how the White Sox were prepared for postseason. Well, the Astros certainly the similar situation. Winning on the last day of the season, beating the Cubs. The Phillies finished one game behind in the wild card. And here they are in the World Series. Burke pops it up. Shallow left, and Potsednik is there. A one, two, three, sixth inning. Bottom half coming up. Andy Pettit back to work. Part of the order coming up for the White Sox. They trail by two. Two, one, two, three, four. First kid on that tape piece has waited about nine years. The young lady at the end, 92 years. All the while, the song, Raspberry Beret by Prince. Right off Tim's iPod. First pitch a strike, and now a ball down and in. Jermaine Dye, Paul Canerco, and Carl Everett. The three, four, and five hitters for the White Sox down a couple here in game two in the sixth. Two and one. I think this is the first 3 1 count that Pettit has run against the White Sox tonight. Hasn't walked anybody. Guy pops it up to the right side. Berkman couldn't get there in time. Full count. Wind is blowing the baseball all over the place. And if you don't believe me, you could ask Berkman, Biggio, or Burke what the wind has done with the baseball here in game two. Three two for Pettit. Die reached out to get it. Stays full. center field slicing the lane one away here in the bottom of the sixth Carlos Bernard from the show 24 the hit show and a new hit Stacy Keach cast members of prison break with us tonight in Chicago and if you haven't seen this season's breakout hit Fox Monday is the perfect time to get on board prison break returns with a special two-hour event tomorrow night at 8 Eastern 7 Central right here on Fox viewer discretion is advised pitches inside for a ball Tim a guy who so loved his brother that he went to prison to break him out there's a break yes. Paul Canerco has struck out and grounded out one away in the inning and that drops over the inside corner one and one Deck the DH Everett. Wide 
Two and one on Canerco. You know, all pitchers concentrate when they're out there, but I don't think anybody shows the concentration any more than Andy Pettit. Those eyes are very penetrating. Rain really picking up now. Three and one. Two. Good a, running catch. What a good play by Jason Lane. Obviously a tougher play for a right-handed thrower. But because the gloves on the right hand makes a nice play. Well done. It's got to be a little disconcerting with that guy standing right there. <laughs> I mean it's a chain link fence and Lane turns around and he thinks somebody's standing behind him. <laughs> but it's the security guard out in the bullpen. Just Here, I got it. <laughs> Let's just make sure that guy doesn't end up in my lap. Making sure that that fence is nice and strong. Two out, nobody on. The crowd is sitting here in the rain, and they're saying, hey, Andy. I know you want to have good footing and all, but it's cold and I'm wet, so get up on the mound and throw it. A few people booed Pettit as Chad Qualls starts to loosen for Houston. With two down, Everett fouls it. Let's go down to Chris Myers. And the rain has been falling steadily for the last 30 minutes. They just grabbed a bag of uh, the grounds crew of the uh, the drying agent for the field here. I did talk with Andy Pettit before the game. He's from Baton Rouge. His thoughts are with those affected by the current hurricane. His family survived Katrina okay, but he said he had some friends from New Orleans who lost their homes. Pettit proud of the city of Houston for stepping up and reaching out to help those uh, who needed shelter. Houston gaining in population and in popularity. All right, Chris, thank you. And Andy's 1-1 one, one pitch is foul. 1-2. Now calls Deer Park, Texas. Oh, Andy Pettit. I was thinking as we were watching him peer over the edge of his glove, we went back and checked the tape. Back in 96, when you and I first did our World Series, and Pettit was pitching for the Yankees, if that was his look in at home plate. Not only did his workout regimen change when Roger Clemens showed up, but he seemed to take a step forward with his confidence with his concentration with his toughness out on the mound not to say he wasn't before but Roger Clemens has been such a great influence on Andy yes, Pettit absolutely here's a one two Everett floats one to center and that's a two out hit Carl one for three and he's on to keep this sixth inning alive for Chicago with Aaron Rowan coming to the plate I think one of the reasons that Chad Crawls is up. This ball in on the hands of Everett. He fights it off for a hit. I think one of the big reasons, the two, three, one counts on Jermaine Dye and Paul Canerco, both hitting the ball well the other way. And now the Everett hit. You don't have to have a big inning against a pitcher for a manager to get a, a reliever up. That is ripped down toward the corner. It is fair. Burke digs it out. Everett ends up at third, and it's second and third with two down on a double by Rowan. Looked like a changeup to Aaron Rowan, who's a good off-speed hitter. This ball just fair down the left field line, just inside the left field line. About three inches. A lot of ways that Phil Garner can go here. You can have Pettit pitch to Krasinski. And that appears to be what is going to happen. You know, the other side of it is Pettit is almost done for Houston. 
what they desperately needed, which is get a lead to the late innings and turn it over to this dominant bullpen. And even though Qualls is a right-hander getting loose, we mentioned last night, he's held left-handed batters to a 208 average during the season with his stuff he's good against lefties but no surprise that Kierzynski will face Pettit but Andy Pettit is about at the end of his night as he approaches 100 pitches that's an interesting point because with Kierzynski and then Creedy coming up I would think this would be Andy's last guy regardless of what happens well here's A.J. Kierzynski a hit could tie it 4-2 in the bottom of the sixth Second and third, two out. Popped up. The shortstop, Everett, fighting that wind and the rain has it to end the sixth. Andy Pettit through six innings with a 4-2 lead. We go to the seventh, game two. Astros up a couple back after this from your local station. Mark Burley is back to work. We check our Doppler radar. I didn't even know we had this, but we do. Thanks to Fox News. As the time rolls forward, you can see the weather coming off the lake. Nothing heavy, but just steady rain that we have, and more importantly, the fans have endured here at U.S. Cellular Field tonight. Started this game in a little drizzle, and really, for the most part, hadn't stopped. Bottom part of the order, Osmus, Everett, and then Biggio for the Astros, who are up by two here in the seventh inning of game two. Luis Vizcaino is getting loose for the White Sox. Dan Wheeler is getting loose for the Astros. On one and one. Osmus into the air to left center field. Going to get it is Rowan. Aaron Rowan moments ago had this conversation with Adam Everett, the Astro shortstop. Uh, how's the weather in Houston right now? A lot better than this? About a thousand times better. <laughs> About a thousand times better than this. And if it isn't, they've got a roof. It covers Minute Maid Park. But that's where this series will go. Travel day tomorrow and game three will be on Tuesday night. 64 degrees at the moment in Houston. Here's Everett. The other half of that conversation. He pops it up. Back and out of play. 0-2. all the rain and the latter innings just hopeful that neither side is penalized by the wet ground that's going to affect the infielders and the outfielders on balls hit on the ground humidity 34 percent Houston and Creedy with a diving catch to his right Everett is thinking what do I have to do he finally hits one hard and Creedy is there leaning Catching and diving for the second out. Adam Everett hit it to the wrong guy. Now it's Biggio. Burley pulled the string. Talked about it last night. Creedy originally signed as a shortstop. They moved him to the outfield because of his great arm. But it didn't work because he has a depth perception problem. So the third base, he is a guy that should nail down gold glove after gold glove at third base for the White Sox. 0-2 on Biggio. Hitless tonight. Ball one. Gets through seven. 
And 0 for 4 night for Biggio. And the Sox head off the field. Strike three over the outside corner and the sixth strikeout of the night for Burley. God bless America here in Chicago. And right now, let's go to public address announcer Gene Honda. Well, Dan Wheeler will take over. Andy Pettit did his work. Six innings, two runs, eight hits, no walks, four strikeouts. And Pettit leaves with his Astros up four to two. Bottom of the seventh. Joe Creedy first up, one for two tonight. Has an RBI, takes a strike. Tim Dan Wheeler is one of those guys in the category of not necessarily an older pitcher, but a guy who just found it. And after bouncing around with the Mets, he has been a huge part of the bullpen for the Astros. He really has. 71 appearances on the year. He has Creedy out in front, off balance. One out. We saw Bruntlett is in at second base as Garner adds to the defense. The World Series on Fox, sponsored by Nissan, who invites you to shift the way you move through the world. By John Hancock, who's official sponsor of Major League Baseball. By Verizon Wireless, it's the network. And by Lunesta. Ask your doctor if Lunesta can make a difference for you. Joe Creedy fouls out. Here is Uribe, who is one for two. Takes a ball. Jerry Reinsdorf, his 25th year. We had a chance to visit with Eddie Einhorn before the game. And they are riding this wave. And having a ball with their beloved Chicago White Sox. On the outside corner, a strike to Uribe. Mentioned the six world championships that Reinsdorf has while owning the Chicago Bulls. Here's a shot into left center field. Well hit at the wall. It's off the wall. Uribe digs into second with a one out double. Saw a shot of Roland Heeman. He's watching as their shortstop. Picked up from the Rockies, shoots one off the wall in left center. You know, Phil Garner telling us about Dan Wheeler, he said, of course, every pitcher who gets the ball up is vulnerable to a ball being hit hard. He said, but for some reason, particularly Dan Wheeler, he almost gets under his fastballs occasionally, and he got under that one, left it up. And Arebe hammers it to left center. Well, you say he's got kind of a funky delivery. Yeah. Kind of slings it to the plate. Tying run at the plate for the White Sox. Bottom of the seventh, but Sednik. 0 for 3. Strike one. Wheeler's deception comes when he picks his left leg up. It looks like he's coming forward, but there's a, a bit of a hesitation right there, and then. He takes his stride. That little difference can really throw a hitter's timing off. One ball, one strike. You could see Wheeler going through this seven. And then this could be a two inning night for Brad Lidge. Lidge has not been on the mound since that game five. Home run, he surrendered in the ninth inning to Albert Pujols in the NLCS. Well, he has had a ton of rest. Runner at second, one out, 1-1 one, one pitch, strike two. Yeah, the bridge to Lidge may be a short span tonight. Astros hoping that Wheeler is the only one to have to do it. In-game box score brought to you by John Hancock. Monsednik at the plate over three tonight. Aguchi has a hit. By Uribe down at the bottom. Two doubles in RBI and Creedy in RBI single. Roland has had a nice night. One and two from Wheeler to Potsednik. Two down. I believe that was a splitter. Excuse me, Joe. Yep, either a splitter or a tailing fastball. 
from Dan Wheeler to get Hudsednik. Yeah, it was a tailing fastball, a two-seam fastball thrown from a right-hander that goes away from a left-handed batter. And now the inning is up to Aguchi. If you're Phil Garner and you are willing to use Lidge for two innings, which I believe he is, you're hoping that Wheeler gets a Gucci and then you have Lidge for the heart of the order. Die, Canerco, and Everett, the two, three, and four men, rather the three, four, and five after the number two hitter, a Gucci, who waits for a 1 0. Now it's 2 0. As it is for the White Sox, if Aguchi can get on, Jermaine Dye would come up representing the go-ahead run at the plate here in the seventh. And he'll be dealing with Wheeler and not Lidge. Aguchi 15 home runs during the regular season. One. Again, something we talked about at the beginning of the ALCS, Ozzie Guillen believing that Aguchi someday could develop into a guy who could hit in the fifth or sixth spot in the White Sox order as Cliff Polite, Damaso Marte get loose. Here's a 2 1. 3 and 1. Count for Aguchi. The tying run at the plate. Out of play, full count. That's one of the signs the hitter is not going well when he fouls off a 2-0 and a 3-1 pitch the other way. It means he's not getting around on the fastball. I think Dan Wheeler and Brad Osmus do Aguchi a favor to throw him anything other than a fastball here. Three balls, two strikes. Fastball away. Two on, two out. The first walk handed to the White Sox tonight. Our game summary is brought to you by Nissan. The starters, Burley is still in there at the moment. He has gone seven, Pettit went six. Lance Berkman, three runs batted in tonight, 13 for the postseason. And the Astros, two, three, and four hitters, four for eight with a home run and four driven in. Right now, we have a visit to the mound by Jim Hickey, the pitching coach, as he talks to Wheeler. And while they talk earlier, Aaron Rowand on the bench had this to say about this new Houston right-hander. Who we got on him? Sinker slider, predominantly the righties. Okay, he's got a curveball. Sinker ball. like wall, who sinker like run. Good thing. Good thing. Not as good as Paul, but good thing. Got to get him up. All right. Here is Jermaine Dye. Tying runs are on for the White Sox here in the seventh. Two out. Already up one game to none in this World Series. Ball one. The tarp is off the bullpen mound for Houston. And Qualls, and Rowan and Walker were just talking about the dugout for the White Sox. Loosens here in the seventh. He was up last inning. So it shouldn't take him long. Guy tonight is single. Rounded out, flyed out. Two and oh.
Their RBI man, Paul Canerco, who knocked in 100 during the season on deck. the corner two and one it's a pretty good 2 0 pitch from Wheeler needing a strike and getting it over the outer edge of the plate two balls and a strike on die who homered last night balls and a strike. The thing about this situation is that Dye's strength is Wheeler's strength. Dye a good low ball hitter. And Wheeler, in order to be effective, has to keep the ball down. Back here to run the count full. Now the runners will go. Uribe off second. Aguchi off first. And Qualls is getting ready with Canerco coming up next. Decent speed on the bases for the White Sox. Off they go and Dye pops it up back and out of play. hit by the pitch to load him up and now the bases are loaded with two down and Garner is going to come out and talk to the home plate umpire wondering if that hit the knob of the bat as opposed to the body of die let's take a look oh that hit the bat it certainly Good did one. looked to me like it did Either the bat or the right forearm. That looked like it hit the barrel of the bat of Jermaine Dye. <laughs> Home plate umpire evidently heard it hit the right arm of Jermaine Dye. Right. Wheeler is out. Qualls is in. Canerco coming up with a bases loaded. Two out. Chad Qualls worked an inning and two-thirds last night. Seven games this postseason. Nine and a third. And he inherits a bases loaded. Two out. With Canerco on. And he rips one in the left. Canerco. Grand slam.
First, let's go back to how the White Sox loaded him up before that dramatic blast by Paul Canerco to put Chicago up by two. A 3-2 pitch up and into Jermaine Dye. Does it hit the arm of Jermaine Dye? I would say no. It hit the bat. He was awarded first base. First pitch from Qualls. Goodbye. Bedlam in Chicago. followed with a hit and he draws a throw from Qualls. First slam in White Sox series history. In for a strike to Rowan. It was Aaron Rowan who asked Greg Walker the hitting coach about Dan Wheeler. You may remember the words. Wheeler doesn't have the sinker that Qualls has. Paul Canerco taking heed of that, looking for the fastball. He got it up and hit it out of the ballpark. Catchers don't catch too many high sinkers. Wheeler took over to start this seventh. Creedy fouled out. Uribe doubled. Upsetnik struck out. Gucci walked. Here's Emmett running on a pitch down and in. Throw by Osmus is in time. And then after Jermaine Dye was hit by the pitch, according to home plate umpire Jeff Nelson, Falls took over. And then Canerco took over. The grand slam as the White Sox up in game two. 6 4. How will the Astros respond here in the air? Paul Canerco with the single biggest swing of his career. A two out grand slam in the bottom of the seventh. White Sox up. 6-4 and Cliff Polite takes over and delivers a strike to DeBarris. Two, three, and four hitters for Houston. And there will be a lot of talk about that 3-2 pitch to Jermaine Dye. Home plate umpire Jeff Nelson ruled that the pitch hit Dye and awarded him first base. The pitching change and the grand slam followed. Tavares flies to right. Die makes the catch, and we go back to the 3-2 pitch to Die in the bottom of the seventh. If the ball hits the bat, it takes the trajectory down after that, like that ball. Had it hit the arm, it either goes up or parallel to the ground. Watch Die's reaction. He doesn't go to first immediately. And I think that is the most definitive look right there at the right arm. Granted, he's got a black sleeve on his arm. But there is a gap between his right arm and the baseball, which hits the black barrel of his bat. And again, that ball went down once it went through the hitting area. So here we are in game two of the World Series talking about a play at the plate with home plate umpire Jeff Nelson awarding the White Sox and die first base. One out here in the top of the eighth inning. It was game two of the ALCS. With Doug Eddings behind the plate. A swing and a miss and a ball that it looked like ended the frame. Josh Paul catching for the Angels. The ruling by the umpire was after initially signaling the out that the ball hit into the dirt before Paul made 
the catch of the pitch. And with A.J. Pierzynski going down to first, he was eventually awarded first. Moments later, the White Sox took game two to even the series at 1-1. Why is that pitch significant? Instead of bases loaded in the pitching change in the bottom of the seventh moments ago, it's a foul ball, still a 3-2 count sure. on die, two on, two out, and another pitch from Wheeler to die. Who knows what might have happened in the bottom of the seventh for the White Sox. As it is, Canerco is a hero, and it was not cheap off the bat of Paul Canerco. That ball was blasted into left. Potts and Vizcaino are ready to go if Cliff Polite needs help here in the eighth. Burley seven innings. He's in line for the win if the White Sox hang on. Kirkman is gone. We go back to game two of the ALCS. Pierzynski at the plate. Paul thinking the inning is over. Rolls the ball back to the mound. And then next thing you know, Pierzynski's at first with two out. Ozuna pinch run. Steals second and scores the game-winning hit. The game-winning run on the hit by Creedy. And now here tonight, that was ruled hit by pitch instead of a foul. Base is loaded and Canerco follows with a grand slam. Here's a pitch outside to Morgan Ensberg. Two out, nobody on. Ensberg is homer tonight, one for three. One and one from Police. Good hot fastball from Police to Innsburg. A lot of times an umpire will go by sound on a, a pitch that is that close where they can't determine whether it's wood or bone. And perhaps Jeff Nelson went on sound and not vision. Strike two from Police, who hasn't pitched in two weeks. Two down, Ensberg grounds to short. Uribe, bottom of the eighth. This place is alive now. White Sox coming to bat. Up one game to none. Leading game two, 6-4. The World Series on Fox, sponsored by the all-new supercharged Range Rover Sport. By Radio Shack. And by Taco Bell. Think outside the bun. Bottom of the eighth inning, Drake McLean, very popular owner of the Houston Astros. Chairman and CEO can't wait for this series to get down to Houston. Neither can those fans have packed Minute Maid Park and just shook that place during the NLCS with St. Louis. Here's Aaron Rowan, six, seven, and eight hitters for the White Sox, who now lead by two. Bottom of the eighth, and Qualls is back to work. It's a double hit. One ball, one strike. T.C. Chendon chopped it off the plate and knocked it with his bat back out of play. Mike Gallo, a left-hander, is getting loose for Houston. Here's a 1-1. One -one. Strike two. Bobby Jenks, who lit up the radar gun last night, is getting loose for the White Sox in their pen, preparing for the night.
two and two. Chopper, Ensberg, scooped by Berkman. One away in the eighth. Fans join Major League Baseball in our efforts to rebuild the Gulf Coast. Support Habitat for Humanity by calling 1-800-HABITAT or logging on to MLB.com or Habitat.org. Now with Pierzynski coming up, the Astros are going to go to Gallo out of their bullpen. Here comes the lefty, Pierzynski due at the plate, bottom of the eighth, 6-4 Chicago. Time now for our WebMD health update. We look at the sore left hamstring of Roger Clemens. His status for game five is still unknown. Day to day, had to leave after two innings last night in game one. You can check out your own symptoms and learn more about common sports injuries at symptom.webmd.com. New pitcher is the left-hander, Mike Gallo. Got into 36 games during the regular season. And makes his first World Series appearance with Lidge getting loose. As Pierzynski waits with one out, strike one. That would lead you to believe that Phil Garner will leave Gallo in there to pitch to Pierzynski and then make the move to Lidge after Mike faces A.J. Gallo with two games in the National League Championship Series, two-thirds of an inning, a third of an inning in each game. Pierzynski grounds to second. Gruntlet takes care of the out, two down. And let's see if Lidge is coming on to face Creedy. You know the question will be asked after the game. This was going to be a two-inning night for Lidge anyway whether the question's fair or not. Why in the bottom of the seventh with the game on the line, Canerco coming up, two out, would it be anybody but Brad Lidge? And I'm sure Phil Garner will say the seventh inning is too early for my closer to come in, period. So he's going to leave the Mike Gallo in to pitch to Joe Creedy. A bit of a surprise right here. Perhaps Lidge isn't ready. Brady did not go around, and that's ball one of the dirt. Creedy tonight, an RBI single. He's grounded out, fouled out. He fouled out to start the seventh. And then the White Sox went to work. Backing up on it is Ensberg. The inning is over. Bobby Jenks, the closer, coming on for the White Sox. Seven miles per hour from Bobby Jenks for a strike to Jeff Bagwell. It's Bagwell, Lane, and Burke for the Astros who are down two. Top of the ninth inning, game two. Last night, Jenks struck out Bagwell with two on and two out to end the top of the eighth. 0 oh and 2 is the count here to start the ninth. Brzezinski <laughs> had to reluctantly throw his body in front of that ball that bounced in front of the plate, ball one. The reason a catcher would do this is you don't know if, if a hitter's going to have a check swing or not. Now with two strikes. I think that was a curveball, about a 57-footer. Two and two. Last night, the combination of Cots and Jenks saved it for Chicago. Hermanson joining Cots.
Hermanson for the majority of the year was the closer for Rozzy Guillen. But they found Jenks at the end. Are they glad they did. Yeah, I think the Astros are finding out that the ball down in the strike zone easier to handle than the ball up in the strike zone. Bagwell into center field. Rowan will not get there, and the Astros have a leadoff hit in the ninth. I think that pitch was just above the knees. You can see Pierzynski setting up, up, and that ball right around the knees of Bagwell. And he opens the Houston ninth with a base hit. So now Bagwell is on, and Jason Lane, who hit 26 home runs during the regular season, has two in the postseason, steps in. One on, nobody out. Lane, strike one. Tied him up with a fastball. Oh, and two. Jenks gave up three home runs in just over 39 innings pitched in the regular season. One out. No gas shortage in Chicago. Wow. Ozzy Keehan was sitting on a golf cart during spring training watching some of the young pitchers the White Sox had ready to fill in in the minor league ranks and he heard Bobby Jenks throwing <laughs> on the first day and he said wow Jenks had had some off the field issues Ozzie Guillen told him if you keep yourself on the straight and narrow baseball end of it will take care of itself and you will be in Chicago before the end of the year here he is trying to close out game two of the World Series after getting the save last night in game one. Burke he's got a flair for the dramatic during this postseason. It's 2 and 0. Three balls no strikes in a World Series fact 11 of the last 12 teams. The 2-0 series lead have gone on to win the series. White Sox trying to get to 2-0 here tonight. And that misses to put the tying runs on. Two on with one out. And Ozzie Gein is wondering where those last two pitches were. A hit, a strikeout, and now a walk. Ozzie Gein did not think that ball was too high. But of course, agreement's not part of the deal as Don Cooper is out to talk to Bobby Jinx. Well, now you've got Osmus at the plate. And if the Astros have one bopper on their bench, that person would be Mike Lamb. Mike Lamb, who homered last night, has three home runs in the postseason. But the Astros elect to stay with Osmus despite Palmero and Lamb on their bench. And Osmus has two hits tonight. He's hitting over 300 for the postseason. Bagwell at second. Burke at first. Strike one. We also talked about it last night, an inclination to throw a wild pitch. He had four in 39 innings this year.
Davis waits, two on, one out. Check swing grounder to the right side. The runners advance to second and third, two down. And now with Everett, the next scheduled hitter, he's coming back to the dugout. And we'll see if it's Lamb who comes off the bench for Houston. Lamb or Palmero, one of the two. Or Vizcaino, and it's Vizcaino more of a contact hitter. So Vizcaino gets the call, and Palmero and Lamb will stay on the bench. Because of the presence of those three, an interesting move by Phil Garner to keep Osmus in the game at the plate, a check swing grounder, and now the Astros with Vizcaino coming up or one hit away from potentially tying this game, but two out in the ninth. Everett 0 for 7 in this World Series, 0 for 3 tonight. And here's Vizcaino. Remember, defensively, the Astros pulled Biggio out, put Bruntlet in, and he's on deck. Vizcaino, a base hit to left. One run scores. Here comes Burke. Throw home. Safe, and the game is tied. Vizcaino delivers. 6 6 in the ninth. What a slide by Burke. He got his hand in there to tie it at six. On the first pitch against Bobby Jinx, Vizcaino delivers the throw by Putsednik toward the first base side just a hair. And you're right, the slide, the hand on the plate ties it in the ninth inning. Great slide by Burke. And for a guy who last night looked untouchable, Bobby Jenks gives up two hits, a walk in the inning, and Biz Caino, a longtime big leader, leaguer, a professional hitter, delivers for Houston. It's a 6 6 game, and Jenks is gone. Potts is coming in. Mike Lamb is coming up for Houston in the ninth. Silver deals with Lamb, and the first pitch is up and in for ball one. Lamb was announced as the pinch hitter for Bruntlett. Jenks is out. Mark Burley, tonight's starter for the White Sox, consoling Bobby Jenks. Gives up two on two hits, a walk, and two thirds of an inning. And now Cots is just trying to keep it tied. 6 6 in the ninth, one ball, one strike on Lamb. Now the Astros are in a position where they've got their closer, Brad Lidge, ready to go when needed. As they've gotten up off the deck and tied the White Sox. That's down and away, two and one on Lamb. Go ahead run at second in the person of Jose Vizcaino, the 37 year old, who's played in the big leagues in three different decades. Lamb trying to poke it into left, it's two and two. And harken back to the 2000 World Series in game one when Jose Vizcaino single the left field almost in a, the identical spot to win the game for the New York Yankees against the New York Mets. Here's a 2 2 to land in the air to left. Potsednik is there in this game. Game two is going to be tied going into the bottom of the ninth. Who's coming up? Uribe, Potsednik, Iguchi for the White Sox in a 6-6 game. Now the White Sox and the fans here in Chicago will get a taste of the Houston closer, Brad Lidge, who's got electric stuff. It's a 6-6 game, bottom of the night. Mike Lamb, who pinch hit, stays in the game to play first. Chris Burke comes in from left to play second. 
the double play combination partner is Jose Vizcaino it's short and moving from first out to left is Berkman remember at the top of this ninth Bruntlett and Everett were lifted for pinch hitters here's Juan Uribe and he gets a look at Brad Lidge The last time Brad Lidge pitched in a game was in Houston, the Pujols home run. Met with silence as he left. And tonight he comes into the game, met with silence here in Chicago because of that remarkable hit by Jose Vizcaino. I've said Nick and Aguchi will follow 6-6. A battle for game two. Down and in, two and one. If you think back to the top of this ninth inning, the Astros put two on, have one out, and you're thinking, okay, Osmus is coming up. You got the likes of Palmero, who's been a very good pinch hitter in his big league career with the Angels, Cardinals, now Houston. You've got Lamb, who's been red hot. That's on the outside corner. But it's Vizcaino who gets tapped on the shoulder by Phil Garner to go up and hit, and Vizcaino takes the first pitch and flips it in the left. Great slide by Burt, and it's a 6-6 game. That's in the air to left center field, and back to get it is Tavares. One away. After being a hero in the top of the ninth, Vizcaino came out to take over at short. All jazzed up, and he forgot something. You have to play with a hat. Came up originally in 89 with the Dodgers. And Tim, you and I have seen him in different spots in his big league career. And he has bounced around and always been a very good part-time player wherever he's been. Absolutely. But to me, he was not the obvious choice in the top of this night. Nope. But the right one. But the right one. The 1-0 pitch. 2-0 on but second. Seventeen year career. A 271 average. With one out, a 2-0 pitch. Do you, sir, buy into the theory that people said with regard to Lidge? It would have been nice to get Lidge in the game in game six in St. Louis in the NLCS to get that taste out of his mouth from the Pujols home run. I don't think that taste is there. But Sednik hits one to deep right center field. Back at the wall. This ball is gone. But Sednik goes deep. His second home run of the postseason. And the White Sox win it seven to six. has a new taste. The taste might be there now. Scott Putsednik had no home runs this season. None. Unbelievable. Over 500 regular season at bats for Putsednik and not one home run. But he homered in game one of the division series. And he homers to end game two of the World Series. things happen unbelievable and this place is sent into a frenzy again with Potsednik Holbert in game one of the division series against Boston he became the second player in Major League Baseball history 
to have over 500 at bats during the regular season, have zero home runs, and then go deep in the postseason. He's now homered twice in October for the White Sox. And that look on the face of Aaron Rowan says it all. Shock and awe here on the south side. Podsednik with a blast to right center field. Our Chevy Post game is coming up as the White Sox win it in the night, 7-6. Welcome back to the Chevy Major League Baseball postgame show on Fox. Chevy, an American revolution. Final score, bottom of the ninth. A home run by Vodsednik wins it 7-6. to six. With a hero, let's go to Chris Myers. Thanks, Joe. The shot heard around Chicago. And, Scott, they're still standing. They, they haven't sat down after, after that mammoth home run. <laughs> Incredible. What a game. What, what a ball game. From, from pitch one, it was, we knew it was going to be a battle. The series was going to be a battle. Uh, Were you thinking home run when you went up against Brad Lynn? Come on. I, I, was, I was sitting on the fastball the entire at bat. I was hoping he'd leave one out over the plate. I just wanted to put a good wood on it. So uh, he left one right there, and I put a good swing on it and was able to drive it out of here. I mean, not only does it change this game, but it could change the series. You're two wins away now, Chicago, the White Sox from a World Series title here. Well, we're, we're going to celebrate and enjoy this win, but uh, the ultimate prize comes after two more wins. So it takes four wins to win this thing. So it's up to us to maintain our focus, go in uh, Tuesday ready to play. All right, where did the, the postseason power come from? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe at least that'll get my teammates off my back if I went the entire year without hitting one. All right, well, congratulations. Thank Scott Pacific. Uh, we have Paul Canerco real quick. I just wanted to talk to you about the uh, the Grand Slam home run. We, we thought that was going to be the game winner. That What went through your mind as you watched that evaporate as Houston battle back to time? Well, just that these guys uh, on the other side just won't go away. I mean, it's like playing ourselves. I mean, they just don't quit, and they keep battling. And, um, hey, we just came in, and we had a good attitude. We got a dugout. I knew we had a good chance when we came in the dugout after they No one was down. Everybody was ready to go. And, I mean, you know, Pod's got to hit a home run all year. He's got two in the postseason, and he'll never hit a bigger one than that. Were, were you thinking home run when you went up? It was the first pitch from Chad Qualls. I was looking basically right where he threw it. I wasn't thinking home run, but I was thinking base hit the drive in two runs. Um, and, he, and he's nasty. And I haven't taken a good swing all night. I took one good swing all, all night, and it was on that pitch. And then there, there were two out with that rally, and Jermaine Dye. It looked like on the replay that the ball hit the bat. It was a foul ball, but he was awarded hit batsman. Could you see that? I, not, not from my angle, because I'm on deck. Um, they argued it a little bit, and that's such a tough call for an umpire because if you don't really hear the wood sound, it sounds like hand. And um, it looked like it might have caught a little bit of both, and, you know, we'll take it. It was a heck of an at-bat by him. Did Jermaine Dye tell you about that at all? No, we didn't have time to talk. I mean, everybody was all caught up in, uh, you know, getting the lead, and then we were caught up with blowing the lead, and then uh, obviously Pods came up big, and, you know, we're happy to get this game because we know going to Houston's a tough place to play. we still got a lot of work ahead of us. Right, congratulations on the new board this week. Have a safe trip back to Houston, Paul. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, Joe, back up to you. All right, Chris, great job. Our Chevrolet player of the game. I'll wait with the rest of you. Who do you think it is? <laughs> Not Canerco. On Sunday. With a game-winning shot in the bottom of the night. As Canerco said, he'll never have a bigger swing. In recognition of his outstanding play in the home run. Chevrolet will make a $1,000 contribution to the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Chevy and American Revolution. Over 500 at-bats during the regular season. Not one home run this year for the White Sox. Game 1 Division Series against Gonzalez and the Red Sox. A shot down the line. He went deep. Second player to ever do that without going over the wall during the regular season with over 500 at-bats. And wouldn't you know it, here he is, game two of the World Series. Canerco had hit the slam at the seventh, but it took a shot by Potsednik after the heroics by Vince Caino to win it for the White Sox. Genie and Zul Genie Zelasco and Kevin Kennedy will be along after this as the Chevy Post game continues. Postgame show on Fox Chevy, an American revolution. The birth of a new era for White Sox fans. We know this is a new White Sox fan. Ava Krasinski giving Daddy the big hug. She's not very alert, but I think at some point in time <laughs> she will be well aware of the potential 
for history in Chicago. Someday Daddy will tell her all about it. And maybe Sunday Houston fans will look back and say, why was Andy Pettit not coming back in in this one in the seventh, going well, hitter by hitter? What I saw as a manager, he got the ball up a little bit, wasn't quite finishing off his pitches at the end of the sixth inning, and I think uh, getting out of that inning, I'll pop up to Brzezinski with two guys on, Phil Garner said, you know what? I'm going to start fresh with a new pitcher. And Dan Wheeler has done a great job, but as you and I were talking as it was happening, uh, Andy Pettit's a big-time pitcher. He's a, as a young bull, bullpen for the Houston Astros. And I kind of would like to see him go back out there. He had 98 pitches, but there's no pitch count in the postseason. He kind of go hitter to hitter. He was pitching phenomenally. He was getting out of innings when he needed to. The mound presence of Andy was big, but we don't really know what the conversation was either between Andy Pettit and You Bill notice he was starting to labor a little bit. You yeah. notice that he was getting tired, but you have to you have to realize that this really was a situation where they needed to win this game. Yeah, and then the key, obviously, was the Jermaine Dye we played, we saw, but even before that, Iguchi getting walking to Gucci was you know really unacceptable and that was the key for me he could only tie the game and once you load the bases with die you're forced to bring balls in and one thing I learned the first year ever managing rookie ball Larry Sherry who Sox fans will marry Larry Sherry 1959 he was my pitching instructor in Great Falls Montana he said Kevin always give your closer always give your reliever a chance to make a mistake when you bring balls in bases loaded two outs there's no room for error there so he throws a strike right down the middle and you heard Paul Canerica talk about it he was ready for it. And the series now heads back to Houston, where you definitely can't count the Astros out. Roy Oswalt going to the mound and the success they've had at home. But we talked about it, the vibe that we're getting. We had this last year, 1918, yeah. talking 1917. Now the White Sox have the third best winning percentage in the postseason in the history of baseball. And it was, what, in the 30s at game time, the second coldest World Series game in the history of the game. Hades may be freezing over because the White Sox are two wins away from a world championship. We'll be right back after this. It's a fact. The more we learn about how to take care of ourselves and our families, the longer and healthier our lives become. That's why more people turn to WebMD than any other health information source. It's a place where people find answers to health questions with an ease never before possible, where doctors discover new and better ways to care for their patients. A place where everyone can finally forge a link between better information and better health. WebMD. I knew he'd come in handy someday. I'm State Farm Agent Ephraim Sanchez, and this is a true story. I never knew that his good grades would save us money on car insurance. I never knew he could get good grades. He cheated. He had a tutor. When I found out about Mark's grades, I got him a good student discount. Dad, if you get me a car, we could get another discount. Mark's getting a car? That's so not fair. More drivers get more discounts from State Farm than anybody else. See what a State Farm agent could save you today. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Welcome back to the Chevy Major League Baseball postgame show on Fox Chevy and American Revolution. The final 7-6, White Sox up two games to none. The winner is Neil Kotz and Tim McCarver. If there's any doubt as to why October baseball captures America's attention, we've seen it the last two nights. These are thrilling games. This is baseball we've witnessed here in Chicago. What a remarkable game tonight. And your comments last night about Roy Oswald and how important game three is going to be is paramount now as far as the Astros are concerned. Absolutely unhittable in game six of the NLCS. Now the Astros turn to Roy to try to get him on the board in this World Series. Podsednik with a game-winning home run to win it in the ninth. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. So as we say goodnight, looking ahead to Tuesday night in Houston, our producer Pete Macheska, our director Bill Webb, for Tim McCarver and Chris Myers and Jeannie Zelasko and Kevin Kennedy, I'm Joe Buck. For more information on tonight's game and the latest in Major League Baseball news, log on to FoxSports.com, powered by MSN. Join us Tuesday night, Game 3 of the 2005 World Series. Coverage begins at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, 5 Pacific. Astros will be down at home, two games to none, to the White Sox. This has been a presentation of Fox Sports, your home for the 2005 World Series. Two thrillers in Chicago, White Sox up, 2-zip.